with us today and also those who are worshiping with us online. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice together. Be glad in it. There are announcements in the bulletin that I would draw your attention to. Church directory update information. There's also information about an upcoming trick or treat event that's happening next, this coming Saturday, October 15th. If you're interested in helping with that. There is also information about the uh, diaper and baby wipe drive that the deacons are currently sponsoring. The playpen or pack and play or whatever we're calling it, I call it the kid cage, which is not correct, is filling up in the fellowship hall. So if you would like to donate diapers or baby wipes, please uh, do so. Uh, that will be uh, greatly appreciated by the uh, clients the Carlisle Area Family Life Center. There's also information in your bulletin on the insert about uh, special, a special offering for Presbyterian disaster assistance as they respond uh, to the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. If you are interested in giving to uh, Presbyterian disaster assistance to assist with Hurricane Ian recovery and future disasters, you can do so Day and again next Sunday, make sure that you mark your envelope or your check with your name and also put Hurricane Relief or Hurricane or PDA or something so that we know uh, that this goes to Presbyterian Disaster Assistance or Hurricane Relief. After worship, as always, you're invited to Fellowship Hall for a time of food and fellowship as one another. Let us now come into the presence of God and worship together.
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. Together, let us pray, confessing our sins. Sovereign God, we confess that we have not turned away from sin. You offer us your grace, but we fail to show our gratitude. You heal us by your mercy, but we fail to do your glory. Forgive us, God, of grace. Save us in faith, so that we may be in the name of God, and enter to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. and sisters, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who Hear him as far as east is from west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. In the name of Jesus Christ, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Just as God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus, then let us also forgive one another and offer signs of peace and reconciliation. The peace of Christ be with you.
lesson comes from uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, 1 to 3, and 7 to 15. <coughs> Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though, a mighty warrior, suffered from a skin disease. Now the Arameans of one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read a letter, the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of a skin disease? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a messenger, a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin disease, are not the Banat and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not have washed in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more? when all he said to you was, wash and be clean. <clears throat> so he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy. He was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation, and our hope is in you all day long. Amen. Do I sound louder than usual today? No? Okay. I have a new microphone. On. It sounds strange to me. You can hear me, that's good.
Now, in the world of the Bible, lepers are considered dangerous and contagious. And there are very strict rules for lepers in Judaism. They cannot live near healthy people. And so they're often driven out into the wilderness to live on their own or in a small group like this. And so the worst part about leprosy is really a toss-up between having the disease itself, which could often be painful, and how lepers are ostracized by society, by everyone around them, even family and friends, which is also incredibly painful. So here's this group of ten lepers, mixed between Samaritans and Jews, and they see Jesus. They see him entering this nearby village where they kind of hang out. And they approach him, or they try to approach him. They call to him from a distance because they have to keep their distance. And they are looking for help. They are looking for help. Now, as I said, there are pretty strict rules, and lepers have to follow these rules because they're so contagious. They had to tear their clothes. They were not allowed to comb their hair. And whenever a leper would be anywhere near other people, he or she had to cry out continually, unclean, unclean, as a warning not to get too close. There are some sources, some ancient sources, that say lepers had to stay at least 50 yards, 50 yards away from the, those who are clean. So you can imagine if these men are 50 yards away from Jesus, they're shouting, unclean, unclean, have mercy on us, Jesus. Have mercy on us, unclean, unclean. I suspect it was quite a scene. Lepers in Jesus' time are people who know all about hope even though they live in such terrible conditions. They also have hope. Because leprosy is not a permanent condition. And when lepers are healed, and they are clean again, they can be restored to their families, and to their homes, and to their communities. They will be welcomed back, just like old times. There is a, a complex ritual for cleansing former lepers, and there are specific priests who are able to verify that lepers have been healed, that they're no longer contagious when they go home. But they can go home. And so lepers, especially this little group of lepers, are always looking for someone who can cure them. They're always looking for the next wonder drug to treat leprosy, the next leprosy doctor who could come their way and potentially heal them. And maybe this particular group, maybe they had heard something about Jesus, something about his miracles and the healings that he has performed, and maybe, just maybe, they dared to hope that he could heal them. Jesus, Master, they cry out, have mercy on us. In other words, Jesus can you help us? Can you heal us? Jesus stops when he encounters those lepers, maybe 50 yards away from them. You can imagine the shouting match going back and forth. And when he stops to greet them, he does not immediately heal them. If you notice, Jesus doesn't do the kinds of typical Jesus healing things when he encounters these lepers. He doesn't lay hands on them and pray for them. He doesn't make mud out of saliva and spread it on their eyes. You know, sort of the usual Jesus things. Instead, Jesus tells them to go away and to show themselves to those priests, those special priests who could verify and certify that they have been healed. Jesus doesn't make any promises. He doesn't set any conditions. He simply says to these lepers, go and show yourselves to the priests. Go and show. And to their credit, all ten of the lepers go to find the nearest leprosy priest who can certify them. They head off 
in different directions, perhaps. And as they went, the text says, as they went, they were made clean. They hadn't bathed in anything. They hadn't used any special lotions or ointments. They simply turned and walked the other way. And as they went, they were made clean. Imagine that interaction for a moment between Jesus and the lepers. He tells them to go to the priests. And I wonder if they're not just at least a little tiny bit disappointed. After all, a leper only goes to see the priests after he's been healed. But as they're walking away, something happens. Something happens. Their skin, it, it starts to clear, and the, the pus dries up, and the sores begin to heal, and that rosy glow of healthy skin begins to return. And these lepers are healed as they are walking to find the priest. There's something to be said for that kind of faith, this faith of these lepers. It's their willingness and their obedience to Jesus' words that cure them. All ten of them are healed, the Samaritans and the Jews alike. They are all healed. Finally, they can go back to their homes, back to their families. Finally, after however long they've been in this little community of lepers together, finally the future is really looking bright for them. All ten of these lepers have faith, but it's only one, and the Samaritan of that, who stops on his journey to say thank you to Jesus. I was thinking about this brief encounter between Jesus and the lepers and what it says to us as people of faith today. I've been thinking about how we are followers of Jesus, and as his followers, we're going forward. We're following his lead. We're looking for where Jesus has already gone so that we can follow him there. We have hope for the future because we trust in God. Not in any human leader, not in any human king or president or ruler, but in God. We trust where God is leading us, and God does not disappoint where God is leading. God does not fail us. God does not let us down. God has given us a future and a hope, as the prophet Jeremiah said. And God has given us the promise of life. And so I began to think that maybe just maybe we are all a bit like those hopeful lepers. The condition in which we find ourselves in this life is not permanent. Our faithful God, our loving Savior, has seen to that. Sin and death do not get the final word in this world. There is hope for all of us. And that hope is not dependent upon the words of man or a woman. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. And as Paul writes to the Romans, hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Hope does not disappoint us. Those lepers understood that. The day they were healed, after years of hoping, they were not disappointed. I've also been thinking about what it means to stop and to say thank you, to give thanks to God. I've been thinking about what it means to stop and notice what Christ has done in our lives. Sometimes we get so caught up in looking towards the future that we forget just how far we've really come. From time to time, people have asked me if I ever preach 
the same sermon twice? It's a question a lot of pastors get. And I'll be honest, I've done it a few times, especially on a week when I've been unusually busy and I've looked through my files and I found a sermon that I thought was pretty good. But a lot of times I read through those old sermons and I think, oh, what was I thinking? How did they listen to that? Why didn't anybody criticize me? And those were the short ones. <laughs> I've come to realize, or hope at least, that I've become at least a little bit better of a preacher over the years. It wasn't something that happened overnight, but step by step, slowly over time, I think proved at least a little bit. I know my sermons got longer, right, Jerry? Yeah. You keep talking. <laughs> but maybe longer is a little better. I don't know. I'm grateful to God, grateful that those early sermons, which I think are mm, maybe not so good, that I've survived those and I've continued on, and that I know God is still at work in me, that God's grace still abounds in my life. I'm not where I was, and I'm not yet where I'm going, but by the grace of God, I'm getting there. The thing that amazes me about this one Samaritan leper is one little tiny detail, and you might have missed it. The text says, then one of them, the Samaritan, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. When he saw that he was healed. Maybe you missed that the first time I read it. When he saw that he was healed. So before he got to the priest who could verify his healing, the Samaritan leper turns back to find Jesus to say thank you to him and to glorify God. Samaritan leper sees that he is healed, sees what God has done for him, and says thank you. Do we notice what God has done for us? Do we see that we are not where we were, but by the grace of God we are someplace else do we stop and say thank you to God for how far God has brought us on this life's journey? When we see how far we have come, how can we have any other response than thank you? How can we do anything but stop and fall to our knees and praise God in gratitude? We take note that it's the Samaritan leper who returns to Jesus, not any of the others, the ones who were probably at least some of them Jews. They were the ones that the people listening to this story would have expected to come back, would have expected to say thank you, would have expected to glorify God, but they do not. Where are their manners? But ultimately, this story is not about good or bad manners. For the Samaritan leper to say thank you to Jesus is going above and beyond what is expected and what is required. Think about the command Jesus gave the lepers. He simply told them to go and show themselves to the priests. That's all he said. He didn't say, then come back and give me a status report. I'll fill you in on the rest of the details. Jesus simply said, go and show yourselves to the priests, and that's what the other nine did. They followed directions. It's the Samaritan who really is the one who doesn't follow directions, when you think about it. The other nine, they are now ready to get on with their lives, to live into the future. But those old divisions that we talked about a little while ago, those old divisions between the Jews and the Samaritans, suddenly they've come roaring back. When they are healed, and when they see that they are healed, the, the other lepers who are Jews, 
They don't want anything to do with that Samaritan leper. They don't want anything to do with him because they are enemies once again. But the Samaritan realizes what has happened and realizes that he needs to give thanks. We heard a similar story in the Old Testament from 2 Kings. Naaman is this powerful man, a military commander for the king of Aram and what is today Syria. But Naaman is also a sick man. He's not healthy. He also has leprosy. And when a young servant girl captured from among the Israelites tells Naaman's wife about the prophet Elisha in Israel, Naaman convinces the king to send him to Israel order to be healed. Even the king agrees. He sends Naaman off to Israel with a, a vast quantity of silver and gold, millions of dollars in today's money, and ten sets of fine garments, the text says. Naaman, you see, expects to be able to buy his health from the prophet Elisha. And, oh, how we are among those same people. We expect to go to the doctor and to be healed immediately. But when Elisha doesn't even come to the front door to greet Naaman, the military commander is outraged. How dare he treat me this way? He wants to stalk away. After Naaman's servants calm him down and talk him off the ledge, they convince him to do what the prophet has commanded him to do in the first place, to go bathe in the river Jordan the seven, time, seven times, even though it's a, a shabby little river, even though the rivers in Damascus are much nicer rivers, they convince him to do it. Because it's easy. And they appeal to his vanity. If it had been hard for you to do, you would have done it, wouldn't you, General Naaman? So Naaman goes to the river. And the seventh time as he comes up out of the water, his flesh is restored, like the flesh of a young boy. And he is clean. And then he returns to Elijah and beautifully, movingly, professes his faith in the God of Israel. Now I know, Naaman says, that there is no God in all the earth except Israel. Naaman, you see, he didn't understand how much he needs God until after he's healed. Naaman comes to Israel thinking he can just buy his way back to health. He goes down to the Jordan, not in faith, but because he has nothing else to lose. And it's in those muddy waters that his faith is born, and that he is able to return to Elisha, giving thanks to God, praising him. In both of these stories that we hear today about the Samaritan leper and about Naaman, and consistently in Scripture, we find God working in unexpected ways with unexpected people. The lowly, the outcast, the diseased, foreigners, to bring about healing and salvation. Healing and salvation that is contrary to the expectations of the world. Naaman the great and powerful is helped by a, a lowly slave girl, the Samaritan leper of all people, comes back to say thank you. The real power in these stories doesn't come from earthly strength or human wealth. The real power in these stories lies with the God whom Elisha and Jesus and you and I, the God that we serve. This is what the Samaritan leper realizes. This is what Naaman realizes. Have you realized this? God calls us, God heals us, God saves us by the death and resurrection of Jesus. God leads us into the future. And God delights. God delights 
and we turn around and say thank you.
Restore among us the love of the earth that you created and gave us as our home, O oh God. Help us to put an end to ravishing the land and the air and the waters. And give us a respect for all your creatures. So that living together in harmony with everything you have made, your whole creation may resound in an anthem of praise to your glorious name. Lord, in your mercy. Renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase the prejudices that oppress us, free us from crime and violence, guard our youth from the perils of this age, give all citizens a new vision of a life lived in harmony. Lord, in your mercy. Strengthen this congregation in its work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love, O God, so that our voices may speak your praise and our lives may be conformed increasingly to the image of your Son. Nourish us with your word and with the sacraments that we may faithfully minister in your name and witness to your love and grace for all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Look with compassion on all who suffer. Support with your love those who are sick, those unjustly imprisoned, those who are denied dignity, those who live without hope, those who are homeless or abandoned. As you have moved toward us in love, O oh God, so lead us to be present with them in their suffering. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, in your mercy. Sustain those among us who need your healing touch, O oh God. Make the sick whole, give hope to the dying, comfort those who mourn. Uphold all who suffer in body or mind, not only those we know and love, but also those known only to you, that they may know the peace and joy of your supporting care. Lord, in your mercy. We pray especially this morning, O oh Lord, for the Kretzing family as they grieve Michael's death. Lord, that you would comfort them and give them peace at this difficult time. And for all those who grieve, for all those who are filled with fear or anxiety or worry, Lord, we lift up our prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O oh God, in your loving purpose, Answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread.
will strengthen the faint heart and support the weak and help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now, remain with you always.